With this session, we're going to dive into what is perhaps one of the biggest stories of the moment. How do we tell the truth about lies? How do we tell the story of misinformation and disinformation? And we've got a great panel who've each been digging into this. Natalia Antalava, Shirley Abraham, and Salem Solomon. And to moderate the conversation, we have Delhi-based award-winning television journalist, Srinivasan Jain. Right now, <laughs> Srinivasan is a bit of a story himself because, in a good way, after ending his 30-year career at what has long been India's most respected 24-hour English news and current affairs broadcaster, NDTV. After reporting and anchoring award-winning shows aimed at debunking official myths and propaganda, he became group editor until he left the network in February after it was taken over by one of India's richest men, Gautam Adani. So, Vasu, will help us through this challenge. Come on up. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you very much, IPI, for uh, giving me this opportunity to moderate such a terrific panel. It's like the perfect antidote to mansplaining to, to have a kind of a all-women's uh, all panel. Um, so uh, as, as Jackie said, uh, you know, I think if you do a kind of word cloud search of all the panels uh, that we've been attending and listening to until all this time, it's likely to throw up disinformation, uh, democracy and disinformation, the two Ds, uh, virtually every time. So clearly this is one of the big stories of the moment. This is one of the big challenges of the moment. Um, and uh, we have, in a sense, the perfect set of people to uh, address it. Uh, Natalia Antalava is the editor-in-chief of uh, the award-winning newsroom of Coda Story, she's based in Georgia. Uh, they are literally at the front lines of fighting against disinformation and propaganda and uh, authoritarian technologies. Uh, Shirley Abraham is a documentary filmmaker from India whose uh, latest film, The Art of Lynching, was in fact screened earlier at the, at the gathering. She's a Khan's award-winning filmmaker. Uh, the film explores, in a sense, the consequences of hateful lies and hateful propaganda uh, and how that actually impacts uh, ordinary citizens. We have uh, Salem Solomon, who is Voice of America USA. She's the senior editor of the Africa uh, division, and she's been bringing local stories from Africa to a wider audience. And uh, Africa, as we know, is one of those countries which has been a kind of almost laboratory for disinformation, and that story doesn't get told enough. So. Uh, we'll be hearing more from her in just a second. I think, uh, you know, I, th I think very briefly when we talk about disinformation, it almost appears to have a sort of diffuse quality to it, that it's seemingly coming from nowhere and everywhere. While in fact, we know as journalists, uh, both on this panel and otherwise, that essentially when we talk about that phenomenon, it's linked very closely to power. It's not in fact something which is amorphous. It's very much linked to how political parties and governments and corporations are enabling and weaponizing falsehoods or propaganda, whatever word we want to use to describe it, to actually remain in power and to, and to hold on to power. And, and I think while it's always been around, uh, the great challenge seems to be that it seems much worse now. I think uh, Frank Bruni in the New York Times wrote that the mendacity has a faster metabolism. The propaganda has more outlets with fewer filters. And I think that's, in a sense, uh, Natalia, if I can start with you, that I think disinformation, in a sense, is almost a kind of misleading term because we're really talking about political falsehoods and, and the consequences of, of that and, and what that's doing to democracy. So, so just to start off with you, because, uh, you know, especially now with the war, and you, you have your hands full dealing with uh, particularly you know, Russian propaganda and misinformation from that part of the world. Uh, but with the war in Ukraine raging, uh, it must be off the charts. So, so if you could just kind of give us a sense of what, what are sort of 
the big stories or the big uh, challenges you're tackling right now with what's going on in that space, and then we'll cycle back and talk about you know, solutions and what's the way that we as, as journalists and media practitioners can, can fight it. Sure. Um, thank you. You know, I have, over the past five years of covering disinformation, I have become quite allergic to the word disinformation, but not as allergic as to that concept that journalists need to be battling disinformation. We don't talk about battling climate change, and we don't, as journalists, and we don't talk about battling other crises. But we've, we are tying ourselves into knots when it comes to um, what is it, misinformation, disinformation, information disorder, whatever you call it. Right. Um, we started at CODA. CODA is a thematic newsroom, and uh, we cover roots of global crises. We did not set up to cover disinformation, but we identified it quite early on as one of the most defining, era-defining crises that that are truly, truly changing our society. Mm. But from the very start, what we tried to do it was to do what we journalists do with any other story, which is find the victims, find the perpetrators, tell the story. Right. Um, I think I take your point on the power, um, and absolutely, you know, the governments have always, those in power have always lied, and now yes. they have more tools to lie, and they have tools to spread the lies further than they have ever managed to spread them before. But I think the this, like information sort of disorder era that we're living in is due not just to lies, but also just to general noise that has filled our space, our ecosystem mm -hmm. and um, you know the greatest challenge um, for journalists I think is breaking through this noise I really truly believe that noise is the new censorship and unless we manage to break through it um, we're gonna we're gonna lose uh, we're gonna we're screwed. <laughs> um, so when it comes to, so how do we break through it? And there, I don't think there's a singular answer to it, but I think there is one answer at our disposal. Um, and the one thing that we have done forever, which is tell stories. Um, I remember when the full scale invasion of Ukraine began in February of 22, um, I had, a, I was invited like literally two days later, um, I was invited on to talk about it on some London-based podcast, mm -hmm. kind of well-listened podcast. And the host was like really pressing me on, he was like, yeah, I really want to talk about the Ukrainian information warfare and their information tactics. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I missed that. I mean, yeah, like there's war propaganda goes hand in hand, but like, what are you talking about? It's like, no, they're really, they're really, you know, they've, they've got some really interest tac interesting tactics. They're really weaponizing social media. And I really thought he completely missed the point because I, I think the war in Ukraine truly shifted at that point, the, that whole information, disinformation kind of play because until then, you know, Western governments had invested millions and millions into like endless creating disinformation warriors and experts and conferences mm -hmm. and grant programs and all of that. And then this invasion began and almost overnight, like people were like, oh, you know, here we have a story that is packed with drama, that has real heroes and has a very clear-cut villain. We understand that, we can relate to it. It's being told to us in ways that we can relate to it. It was just a very compelling story. And I think our job as journalists is above all, and obviously there I'm sure we'll talk about challenges like the AI and all of that, but ultimately it's, it's finding these powerful stories that cut through. And also finding ways to collaborate and finding ways of being more mm -hmm. of a united front and learning, doing, copying. You know, the authoritarians are doing a great job sort of borrowing from each other's playbooks and coordinating. Uh, we should be doing more of that. But ultimately, the most powerful weapon that we have is the weapon of, of telling stories and finding, you know, uh, not turning this disinformation thing into some academic concept. It's a real no. thing that has real victims and that results in real profound change that affects all of us. And that's the story we need to be telling. So, so before I move on, give us an example of how you've actually done that with your, with, with Coda, with tackling disinformation through telling stories that, that have impacted people. You know, I think we, I mean, I can sort of what, do one, endless. One example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, what we really try to do, we don't, 
we don't do news and I wonder uh, a lot of time whether the news industry as a whole just, you know, we. I, th I really think that these days the real responsibility of journalists is to not to contribute to the noise. And we try really hard to identify stories that really like push um, okay. push the needle. And, um, and, uh, and a lot of times, you know, right now these are stories that um, have been in the headlines um, because of the war. But like, for example, um, we did long feature pieces on this debate about biolabs in Ukraine, not the debate about biolabs, but the features on uh, biolabs and the accusations that Ukrainians and Pentagon is like manufacturing biological weapons in places like Ukraine and Georgia. We've done stories on, mm, we had a series called The Clash of Narratives where we uh, followed two people from the opposite side of the narrative, but not by putting them and having them talk at each other, but really being kind of a fly on the wall and trying to um, kind of understand and sort of cut through the cut through the echo chambers of it. Um, I mean, there are endless. I'm failing to come up with uh, more <laughs> examples. <laughs> Lots of them no, no, on codastory.com. <laughs> okay. No, no, we'll we'll cycle back to this. Uh, in a sense, Shelley, this ties into what you've been doing with your work, which is to, to look at those who are impacted by uh, disinformation, hateful propaganda, uh, with, this, with this documentary on someone who's actually the victim of um, uh, you know, mobs that go out and, and kill, essentially, or lynch, as we call it in India, Muslims on this suspicion of, of beef and of cattle trade. And uh, I just wanted to quickly just set the context a little bit before I come to you, uh, especially for the audience uh, who might not be fully conversant, because we, when, I mean, when I was in NDTV, we did a lot of work on the, on the similar kind of stuff as well. And essentially, uh, there's a great deal of sensitivity about the cow in India. Uh, you know, it's considered sacred. There are laws that actually prevent the, the slaughter and consumption of cows in, in most Indian states. Uh, but there's always been this kind of right-wing noise or a conspiracy that there's a secret plot largely by Muslims to, to steal and kill cows illegally, and that's used as a powerful mobilizing force by the Hindu right in India. And essentially, it's such an inflammatory subject that most mainstream politicians won't stoke that, that flame until our current prime minister did. So in 2014, when he was campaigning uh, to be prime minister, he actually spawned a falsehood about a pink revolution. Essentially, he claimed that the, the government in power, which was at that time, you know, they were opposing the Congress party, uh, had engineered a pink revolution, which was the idea that they were basically funding the large-scale illegal slaughters of the cow. And the color pink was this, you know, when you cut the cow, uh, you see the color pink. And that this, Congress government was funding an illegal meat slaughtering industry. Now, this was a completely baseless claim. Uh, you know, India exports buffalo meat, not cow meat. Buffalo, strangely, in India is not considered beef, uh, though it is considered beef in the countries to which it's exported. But this particular claim, he went on repeating it in his speeches, and very shortly after that, there was a massive spike in these vigilante attacks against Muslims, and we actually created a tracker to count it that before, like from 2019 to 2014, the previous government, uh, we counted just one such attack. After 2014, after Modi made that speech to the present, there have been 127 attacks, and at least 60 people have been killed, mostly Muslims, including uh, Rakhbar Khan, who featured in, in Shirley's documentary. So there's a kind of direct correlation between a powerful figure mouthing a dangerous piece of misinformation or falsehoods and uh, you know the immediate consequence on a large section of of indian uh, of the indian population so in a sense shelly i guess the challenge is when you're telling that story and you're pointing out as often the case with these attacks that there's no evidence really that this person was actually trying to slaughter cows or was consuming beef um, and yet there is this very dangerous kind of consequence how you kind of manage to debunk that, how you manage to call it out, and, and whether that actually makes a difference on the ground. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Vasu. That was a, a very efficient setting of context for something <laughs> Sorry, that, that is... No, 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 thank you. Not at all. No. 
<laughs> no, I didn't mean that at uh, all. After this, I shall be <laughs> less <laughs> talkative. Really terrified. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, no. Um, so I think that um, you know when we start looking at this really perverse form of violence that was running across India like a forest fire. Um, it throws into question this whole idea of what are facts and what is information. And, uh, you know, we'd like to think that, yes, you know, facts are just bits of information about a certain kind of happenstance. But in this case, where, um, you know, political falsehoods are being uh, created and those narratives are, uh, you know, spreading across society, it's almost like it's not that the facts are generating, you know, our prejudices or our opinions. It's quite the opposite. You know, believing is seeing. So we are using, uh, you know, as a society who's, that wants to, let's say, criminalize Muslims and then eventually create narratives around their existence that, you know, that somehow necessitate a certain violence upon them. And, you know, we've, we've all been talking about facts and information and how we need access to um, the truth, uh, if, you know, as illusory as it is all the time. It's not quite the facts that are generating these ideas, but these ideas are generating facts like and they are obviously all distortions, like, you know, Muslims um, procreate at a certain rate, or, um, you know, they have these many wives. And factually, of course, I mean, this is all bigotry, and big, there is naturally no fact that, um, mm. you know, can uh, satisfy this ever. But people are not even looking. Like, when we were working on this film on um, the lynchings that were happening all across India, uh, you know, you could actually supply them the right facts that factually it's not true that, you know, Muslims uh, don't sing the national anthem, for example. Um, but nobody is willing to listen because it's, it's like deep-rooted prejudices that are now being harnessed politically mm. to then completely put a community of people at risk and not just put them at risk, but with dangerous consequences. Like these are mob murders. This is a primordial form of violence. I mean, you know, lynching stopped in the American South way back then. But here, this is a primordial form of violence, and Muslims are being murdered uh, by mobs in broad daylight, and the videos are being circulated as, um, you know, as, as some sort of uh, vicious popular culture. At one point, these viral videos became the most circulated things in, you know, in the digital economy. Right. And that's what we are faced with when we are looking at a film like this. And uh, first off, we thought, and I've made feature documentaries before. So first off, we thought that we probably need to introduce an antibody into the same system that is circulating this virus. Understandably, of course, the virus circulates much faster. Um, so we thought we'll create a short film. That was one. The other was that, um, how is it that we can then perhaps, you know, embody both sides of the narrative within the film, not as a way to play them against each other, but to try and understand the anatomy of this violence. Mm. And um, that's something that helps, helped us create a narrative that, you know, then perhaps spoke to more people. Right. So, Salem, I mean, um, again, to this point about how you actually push back against a sort of tidal wave of falsehoods or disinformation or whatever you call it. So, in the context of, of Africa, right, to, to the point that this is not a new thing, and, and Natalia was making this point as well, that it now seems like we're suddenly confronted with it, but it's been around for a long time, and some of these technologies were actually, in a sense, beta tested or field tested uh, in Africa years ago. Right, um, we talked about it earlier as well. Um, it, when I think of disinformation, it's just made up stories, um, and I would like to clearly make a distinction when we talk about disinformation, because misinformation is different than disinformation or propaganda. And as you rightfully mentioned, um, you know, the continent uh, has been uh, a place where um, foreign actors or even internal, um, you know, political actors have used this tactic to um, either advance their political agenda or whatever it is that it's m motivating them. But I, I would say in recent years, uh, it has uh, really been uh, industrial scale, you know, I think it, because of the technological tools available to uh, double down on, on uh, disinformation, we are seeing more and more of it, and we, we, we see different actors, um, Chinese have, uh, apl uh, you know, uh, applied it, uh, political opponents, depending on what context, what country, especially because uh, the region I cover is 50 plus countries, so I can't <laughs> go over 50 plus countries today. Uh, 
everybody would leave. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, to be specific today, I wanted to bring up uh, the most purveyors of disinformation on our continent, our Russian, Russian disinformation campaigns, because it is a global, uh, there is the global nature of uh, that uh, tactic. I wanted to raise uh, Russian disinformation and how it plays out in countries that we cover. Um, Russian disinformation campaigns, obviously, typically, uh, their goal is to either prop up um, authoritarian governments, um, if there is any, you know, a national interest to Russia, minerals, you know, all the good stuff that Africa um, has to offer, or if it's, uh, you know, undermining democracies uh, because it really ideologically does not align with what R Russia wants to do. Um, in the world with this whole big fight between democracies and autocracies that we're mm -hmm. witnessing, not just in Africa. Um, and I actually would um, alert everyone to see and watch Africa because uh, there are uh, lesser checks and balances in some, some of the countries. Uh, most technological tools are uh, usually, it's like a clean slate to test out before, uh, you know, malign actors like what Russian disinformation does before they go out to uh, you know, stable democracies like the US, we've seen it in the election 2016. Um, you, you might not have known about this, and I was working on a story way back when 2016 election was going on. Mm -hmm. I was surprised to learn that Cambridge Analytica was involved 20 years before that in Africa. And uh, they started off as something positive. They were involved in Mandela's election, which was such a surprising uh, finding for me when I was doing research. But this is to say that uh, Africa has been a testing ground for uh, different tactics. I mean, Cambridge Analytica is an analytical tool, data tool. Sure. But now, uh, moving forward here, when you're thinking about disinformation, basically falsely making up stories to confuse or, or create sentiments um, about uh, the West or Europe or democracies, uh, negative sentiments in, in these countries. And we've seen these, th these uh, uh, tactics uh, pop up in so many other countries uh, on the continent. Central African Republic is one of them. Mostly they've, uh, they have their own radio, Russians have their own radio station there. They, are, they advise the presidency there, so there's a lot of mineral uh, interest for them there. Uh, they pop up in places like Sudan in 2019 when there was grassroots uh, movement to topple, not topple, but to, to get rid of the dictator, the then dictator, mm -hmm. former President Omar al-Bashir. Uh, there was Russian disinformation campaign because they wanted to keep Omar al-Bashir because he was looking after their interest and there's a gold mine. We started uh, seeing videos and, and um, uh, disinformation uh, basically tarnishing civilians uh, efforts to make them seem as if they are, you know, tools of the West or they're supported by Israel because it's a mainly right. Muslim-dominated mm -hmm. uh, population, and uh, who was behind it was um, Putin's uh, best friend uh, or chef, they call him, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Uh, he's also uh, part of the, uh, you know, the Wagner group. Uh, a lot of people say that that is a private military uh, contract, but it's yeah. not really private, it's, it's supported by. Right. Anyway, long story short, these uh, disinformation campaigns started popping up. Sudan, Libya, uh, right after Muammar al-Gaddafi was, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, uh, removed with the intervention of NATO, they wanted to create this uh, perception that whenever the West intervenes in these countries, there's chaos. So on the ground, Russia was arming both the militants, Khalifa Haftars, and um, uh, you know the son of Muammar Gaddafi, uh, Sayyid al Islam. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but um, and we saw social media campaigns right. uh, basically supporting both. Um, and so you see whatever it is it takes. It's part of their bigger uh, effort okay. to confuse. Uh, but most recently, earlier this year, we started seeing AI uh, defakes. Uh, videos uh, that uh, purport to be something they're not, and I'll give a little bit of context, but if Dennis can play. So you're not the intended um, audience for this video you're about to watch, <laughs> but uh, these videos started popping up just out of the blue on platforms, on WhatsApp, Facebook, Twitter, uh, where our audience, and, okay. and so let's take a look at this and I'll explain why this what, is what bizarre or, okay. yeah, okay. whatever. 
Hello to the African people, and particularly to the Burkina people. We are Americans from Africa, and we are Pan-Africanist. We appeal to the solidarity of the African people and the people of Burkina Faso to effectively support the authorities of the transition. We must support the patriotic movement for safeguard and restoration and President Ibrahim Traor, who imposes respect for his sovereignty. Let us all remain mobilized behind the Burkina people in this common struggle. Homeland or death, we shall overcome. Hello to the African people, and particularly to the Burkina people. My name is Alicia, and I'm a Pan-Africanist. I appeal to the solidarity of the African people and the people of Burkina Faso to effectively support the authorities of the transition. We must support the patriotic movement for safeguard and restoration and President Ibrahim Traor, who imposes respect for his sovereignty. Let us all remain mobilized behind the Burkina people in this common struggle. Homeland or death, we shall overcome. All right, so homeland or death, we shall overcome. It's like mm -hmm. straight out of uh, something you'd see in like communist the, chants, yeah. whatever. Um, so the backstory here is that uh, Western African countries have had, you know, sentiment, French anti-French -sen anti sentiment. Uh, it's not something Russia created. It's been going on for quite some time. But Russia, what Russia does, whenever they target a country, they look for gaps. If it's the U.S., you know, racial issues are real and legitimate, but they look for cracks and come and exploit that to their advantage. So in this context, when you see Burkina Faso's case, uh, there's been a spate of coups and counter coups in West African countries. Uh, they doubled down. This is, of course, uh, because they want it, they want the junta leaders in place so that they can secure their interests there. They start with these videos just out of the blue started popping up and we're wondering so, where is it coming from? You sorry, know? so just to understand, so these are videos that are made by, you're saying by, by the Russian misinformation machinery? So, uh, yes, so, I mean, I did not independently verify if it's Russians behind this, but sources who speak to us right. who have intelligence uh, and also close contact they're very cheap to make okay. and uh confirm to us that it, the russians are behind this so uh, in our uh in my area of coverage we have 78 million weekly uh, uh you know mm -hmm. audience radio mm -hmm. tv whatever uh, tv all platforms right. so this is our audience so for our for us as journalists the challenge is that when you see videos like this how do we combat it Sure. So this is created by a, an AI a deep fake platform called Synthesia. Most of you who are very close and understand this AI mm -hmm. field and world might know. So I wanted to see how easy it is it to create this and picked one of the women in the picture in the video that you saw, the synthetic media, and did this. Ten seconds. Hello, Hate Adams. Glad to be on this episode of Straight Talk Africa. <laughs> I am synthetic, but people can easily be fooled. Stay vigilant. All right, stay vigilant is what I'm trying to say to our audience <laughs> with this message. Uh, first, I'm conveying that this is the same person, same whatever, uh, one of our TV shows. Uh, sure. with, uh, so that's a uh, shout out to Haiti uh, if she's watching. Uh, Straight Talk Africa is one of our uh, flagship right. shows. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that we started seeing these very cheap, free tools being used right. uh, to spread disinformation. And so this is what we are up against. For the trained eye, like ourselves, you could see closely in their ears, the way they're speaking, the way they're referencing, oh, uh, we're people of, uh, from America, and yes. whatever, to say African Americans. So you know that, you know, people who, uh, th these people that you saw earlier are purporting to be Americans with Pan-African views, trying to support Russian <laughs> it's, Sure, it's no, very no, it's, complicated. It's, it's creepy um, and, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, yeah we, we, we yeah. Uh, try to, to show, uh, to, to tell the truth by showing the tax, tactics that they're using. Right. Uh, so our audience are, um, uh, are aware of the tactics, of but it's very, very, very okay. difficult. Right. Uh, Natalia, this is the crazy thing. I mean, you know, Russian misinformation, other parts of the world hearing about it in Africa. Uh, you and others have been writing so much about this, about, you know, the troll farms, uh, the, the sort of the backing of the Putin regime. Um, has that made any difference? Has there been any sense in which there's been a pulling back or, does, or do they slow down at all or it just keeps rolling on? <laughs> 
It's like the journalism impact question. Yes. Question. <laughs> How do you measure your impact? Yes. It's, How do you measure mother's love? Right. <laughs> um, we don't know. Like, who is thinking? Look, I'm. I think it's um. Uh, that's ultimately what is going to stop the Russian efforts to spread fake news. And I think it's really important the, um, to kind of understand and accept that the power of lies lies in the fact that a lot of them are based on kernels of truth. And uh, the sent I mean, you mentioned the sentiments, um, the anti-Western sentiments are, um, are real and are real for good reason. Russia has done fantastically well at um, exploiting the war in Iraq um, and you know the um, ICC decision um, regarding Putin it was is undermined across much of the world because mm. you know nothing because the US is not part of the ICC and so on so there, there are real injustices there are real issues and real problems that are that create the ground for fakes to flourish. Um, I think what's really important is um, when it comes to journalists that makes a difference and has an impact and it's very difficult to measure that impact. Sure. But I think the problem with this whole like journalism disinformation industry and not to diss anyone's work, I think all of it is really important. But once we get into the reactive mode, once we start debunking, once we say no this is not true, this is a lie, we are, once we're not setting the agenda, once we're not telling our audiences something that they didn't know, something that makes it, we are playing defense. And if you play defense, you know, you can't, you can't be, you can't be successful. Right. So, um, so I think to really truly, and slightly going back to your earlier question, I, I really think that to, in order to truly uh, address the, the issues of, um, disinformation mm -hmm. you really need to address the root causes of it you know and there are various ways of doing it you know we do it by sort of dividing up in a beat into currents that run through it we look at rewriting and a manipulation of history and historic nar narratives we look at how the soft power works we look at how traditional one of our our first sort of editorial project, the proof of concept for CODA, was to do um, a package of stories about um, the uh, Russian campaign against the LGBTQ community. And by the time we did it, it was well established in the minds of most people that Russia was a terrible place to be gay. Mm. But no one had explained why. So going down to this, trying to understand the root causes and empowering your audiences not just with the fact that this is true and this isn't, this is a fact and this isn't, but empowering them with a true understanding. And frankly, as a media consumer, um, that's what I want. You know, I want someone to explain to me what's going on rather than tell me what the latest is. I mean, sometimes it's very important to know what the latest is, obviously. Um, right. So it's a long-winded answer. But, um, and, but another, and I think w one last point, I think another very much of a root cause of this crisis um, are the platforms, is the Silicon Valley, are mm. they, because we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it, and sure, you know, great things came out of um, being in touch with your family and friends, but the business model isn't uh, to keep you in touch with family and friends, the business model works for the lies, and unless that changes, and unless we change the conversation about the platform regulation, uh, about the regulation of the actual product, about how safe it is when it's rolled out in the market, we are going to be losing. Um, and we need, you know, we need more journalism on that as well, because journalism industry has taken so much money from the platforms over the past five years that I'm afraid we've kind of, you know, played part uh, mm. in all of that as well. No, no, that's, that's really true. In fact, in terms of the challenges of, of different ways of combating it, uh, surely there's you know, Alt News, which is a fact-checking website in India, uh, they're a very small team of people and they're literally, it's like, you know, just holding a hand up against the flood. Uh, they're run by, uh, you know, friends of mine and, and I was talking to uh, one of the founders recently and he said that they're so frustrated with actually trying to do this kind of firefighting or fact-checking, this tsunami of misinformation. Futile, it's whack-a-mole game. It's, it's whack-a-mole. So, so they actually are experimenting with something else where they're, where they're trying to kind of do literacy around it at the grassroots level. So they've created an arm which actually goes into particularly underserved areas and is working with children 
and students. Uh, he was telling me about a workshop they're doing uh, with children between the age of 9 to 14, where they actually are teaching them that when you get, let's say you get a WhatsApp forward with a falsehood or with a seemingly sort of piece of misinformation or whatever, what are the ways in which you can try, and instead of just sharing it or forwarding it, you try and find ways of, of perhaps scrutinizing it and analyzing it. Now, it may be a difficult thing to scale this up, but it's just like a different way of approaching it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, organizations like Alt News, you know, they are doing tremendous work in the face of great danger that, you know, that they've been faced with both legal, physical, all kinds of harm and risk. And um, I was thinking about, um, w you know, this whole arena of facts and information and how we need to stay vigilant about, um, you know, what is it being deployed for? Because there was also something else that happened in India, which is that, you know, once the lockdown was announced and it was, you know, like the strictest, harshest, you know, snazziest lockdown in the world, where... During uh, the pandemic. During the pandemic. And soon enough, we had millions of, you know, daily wage laborers who could not afford one single meal in these cities, walking the highways. And when the government was asked about what is the data about these people? How many people are walking the highways? They said no such data is available. So we need to understand that when, you know, the powers that be are not supplying us data, mm. and when they are, you know, maintaining what is now being called data silence, what is that doing? And it is organizations like Alt News and, you know, a lot of organizations that got together to create the facts about the fact that there were 10 million people actually forced to walk the highways home. So it is also about, you know, understanding what is our sense of justice. Because now it is data that is also being linked to justice. Because whatever is measurable enough right. is something that warrants the government's response. So whether it is through, you know, these kinds of incendiary speeches or it is through studied silence, it, it helps if people like us are able to ascertain the value of what each one is doing and then create our responses. Right. Salim, uh, let me just come to you and then if there's time, we'll okay. try and take a few questions from the audience. That Again, coming back to the point of of impact and what's working and whether, for example, all this reportage, you know, about these campaigns, about the Russian disinformation campaigns and so on, is that leading to any greater sense of awareness? Is that leading to any sense that these campaigns are, are sort of like pulling back or it's just, it's, it's making no difference at all? Well, it really is uh, very hard to measure these things. But uh, because the, the disinformation campaigns play off of sentiment that already existed or they're mm -hmm. finding cracks to fan the flames, um, you know, it really, like the Russian uh, sentiment, for, I mean, the French sentiment, anti-French sentiment in West Africa is one example. French troops have pulled out mm. of that region entirely. Uh, several countries that have seen instability, uh, are, we see the Wagner Group as part of the information a broader campaign uh, coming in. I mean, it's all interlinked. Uh, but I would argue to the point about, you know, it is very difficult to track every disinformation. I mean, there's so much, the sheer volume of disinformation uh, is very daunting for humans right. to, to uh, play catch up. Uh, but I would argue that we could all simultaneously do several things as journalists, uh, you know, raising awareness, critical thinking, uh, media literacy lacks, not just in, in, in the region that I cover, but even in the US, you see a lot of that. And so I think simultaneously, um, making sure that the training, media literacy, uh, and others uh, doing that, uh, raising awareness of what, what tactics uh, these uh, campaigns, social media campaigns, are employing uh, uh, to, to disinform or spread uh, falsehoods. But also on top of that, so uh, at Voice of America, we have a great um, initiative called Polygraph, and they look at falsehoods and they call them, uh, you know, they analyze a specific issue and they, they, they uh, say this is a false claim. But also reporting the truth every day, like what we do to, to, sure. to, to bring information to, uh, to people's another way of, um, uh, of combating that. Lastly, um, AI is just a tool. Whether it's deepfakes, 
whether uh, defake or uh, images, whatever tool that we machine, it's a, you know humans are behind it. And so I have seen fact checkers using AI for uh, you know basically matching that energy that we we're just talking about. Um, examples I can mention from our continent is Africa Check, with, you know, and others, and during elections because you see these. Uh, campaigns coming out during elections, du during turmoils, during coup d'etats, and things of that nature. So I would say just um, uh, using tools with obviously interference of human intelligence and the vigilance of, of journalists like ourselves, because it's case by case, it is doable, and I think we should uh, focus on doing it all simultaneously. Right. See, but I, I actually take issue with that question because I think, you know, we're not going to win this game. We shouldn't be playing it. Like we're not going to win the like against the Russian disinformation game. What's going to end Russian disinformation is Russia's, you know, Putin's defeat. You know, that will be. And then there will be someone else who is doing that, and then someone else. What we need to figure out is how do we do our job in this new information ecosystem mm -hmm. and we, when, when we're no longer the gatekeepers. I, it was so striking to hear Ukrainian editors today talk about how they don't get an interview with Zelensky. They don't. He doesn't speak to the Ukrainian journalists. Mm -hmm. He'll speak to the foreign journalists and then he has the platform. Everyone who is in power has their own platform. So in the time when everyone in power has their own platform, what's our role? That's what we need to be figuring out and working on. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so, do we have time for we have one qu zero questions? One question. Okay. Does anyone have a question? We stand in the way of alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> does anybody have? A, I I think that there's like literally one person. So. Hi. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm Aisha Tanzim with Voice of America. Very quick question, and we get this from our audience all the time, and I want to bring it to you guys. You talked about Putin's propaganda war, information war, but then we've also heard about Cambridge Analytica, so they're saying, are you guys, the Western journalists, investigating what Western countries are using the same tools, maybe to spread disinformation or misinformation? Because I think we will lose credibility if we are not equally vigilant against our own governments as we are against, let's say, China, Russia, Iran, or anybody else. So was this a question for anyone specific? No, anybody can answer. But I'm just wondering if th the same tools that are being used to analyze Russian propaganda or Chinese propaganda or Iranian propaganda are being used against the US government and European governments and to make sure that they're not using the tools. OK, anyone? Should I? I, mean, I, I OK, go ahead. Um, you know, I, I'm, Look, I think there's a lot of great journalism that is being done and on, on the European and Western governments and, and all of that. I don't think it's necessarily about the tools. I think where there is a lack of reporting is on the platform accountability side. I think there is a lot more of it now than there was before, but th it's still a huge problem. I think um, the big tech needs to be reported on in a much uh, more aggressive, engaged way um, with, um, you know, we need to hold them accountable in a much more, um, a much more proactively than we currently do. And I think part of the problem is because, you know, most journalism conferences, uh, until very recently, were funded by Meta and Google, and a lot of the research is being funded by Meta and Google and the big guys. And it's a it's a problem. And sadly, it was when they pulled out. You know, journalism didn't say no to that funding. It's the funding that, that it's them who pulled the funding because they're no longer needed because they're putting so much money into the lobbying effort, and that's where there is you know accountability is missing, and there really needs to be more reporting. Did you want to jump in as well? Just quickly, um, I think fundamentally you raised it earlier in the uh, outset of this uh, uh, discussion. Uh, we are having, the world is basically uh, fighting uh, a big ideological fight it's between democracies and autocracies. So when you're looking at, say for instance, uh, this is not to say, in fact, part of the reason why I said I picked Russia's disinformation because they've, they've been the purveyors in the, at a global scale. Uh, but there are other actors as well. But I think fundamentally it's about the transparency and the nature of the, because I work for the Voice of America and when people see, see the Voice of America, they have this false perception that we are the mouthpieces of uh, the government. Um, I 
am originally from an East African country, Eritrea. I worked under uh, <laughs> media controlled, I had no choice. Um, and I know the difference between uh, you know, uh, government funded and government controlled. Right. And it's very important distinction. And the reason why that matters is that uh, I remember I was working on a story, a project, big project on China, Africa at some point, and one of the commentators said, the irony of Voice of America talking about what China is doing, <laughs> which was very interesting feedback to your point. Uh, it's all about transparency. It's all about, um, you know, having a balanced, fair uh, coverage of issues and not being uh, afraid to, uh, to be held to account. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, on that note, are we completely out of time? Thank you all so much for being a great panel and a great audience. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs>